Hello, everybody. Good morning. Let's start the first talking of today entitled Precision Livestock Farming, Technologies Used in the Study of Animal Behavior, Dairy Cattle as an Example. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. João Costa. Uh, João holds a PhD in Animal Science. He is professor assistant at the University of Kentucky, Lexington, United States. He is also the coordinator of the Data Science Program Research Group and director of the Coldstream Data Research Center at the University of Kentucky. Please, John. Ah, João, no disculpe. No problem. I translated your name. Yeah, yeah John, Joe, Costa, whatever. I'm, I'm fine with it all. So, well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Uh, well, Dr. Santana and all the students that are organizing the event. And I was invited to kind of give, to shine some light on how to use precision livestock farming or devices that are were by animals to collect data that can be used on the study of animal welfare on the applied etology research. So what I would try to do today is to give a little bit of introduction of what are these devices, what are these technology, uh, what is precision livestock farming, go through uh, some of, you know, what is out there. And especially, as you guys saw, I work with Derek Caro. I will try to branch out of it, but I will try to talk. I will end up talking a lot about Derek Caro in general. I will bring some examples and then discuss some of the problems and challenges, and especially uh, how that amount of data actually changes some of the hypotheses and some of, well, the science that we do in general. So I will start actually talking about like the most obvious thing is that it's a field that is growing crazily. So it's, you know, the precision livestock farming or precision dairy technology uh for as an example is growing exponentially like i actually just came from the european congress for precision livestock and it double in double in attendance in the last uh two or three years so it's it's an area as you guys know the same thing for humans but obviously uh, it's translated to animals the censoring is an area that grows uh, pretty much double uh every year or so so i bring the road here as our uh, a place because they have a very good website actually with a lot of options is where pretty much the world of precision livestock farming meets uh, once every two years and discuss most of this of these topics and it's really hard for us even to keep track of what is out there what is happening probably what i will show today as an example it's already a little bit older and because that the time that it takes for us to try to make the experiments and actually publish it we're always behind of what the private industry is able to come up with and we live in this place right like the the farmer and even us the scientists we live in this place that we go around we go to our euro tier we go to this uh to these accelerators uh events and we get um overwhelmed by the amount of data the amount of variables the amount of things that we can measure right like here using a cow as an example all the wearables that are out there like so devices that the cow can wear like pedometers, collars, uh, tail, tail props, uh, electronic ear tags that can give us, well, activity, line time, detect astros, if the cow is in heat or not, if the cow is calving or not, time feeding, timeline, uh, and all of that. Plus the infrastructure, well, uh, precision livestock farming in general that goes in the parlor, uh, goes around the farm in general that can give uh, even an older uh, layer of variables that can be measured like body weight body condition the outputs like milk and all of that and we live in this world right that we have this, this major question of how to set up both the management of farms if you are a farmer if you are on the animal protein production side but even if you are a researcher what can I use on my studs to test my hypothesis to use on my studs that will be actually useful and helpful in 
achieve those objectives that we are looking for. Uh, there are some options here. We'll put some links, even making a little bit of marketing for our own uh, web page, uh, the Precision Perry, that is our mascot of my lab. But uh, for D4F, uh, there is a very good setup on the technology that are available, the variables that they measure, and especially the studs and the validation that have been done with those technology, because that is fundamental on the use of that, and I will try to talk about that. But my point is that we live in this world that now we can pretty much monitor anything that the cow is doing, that the cow's uh, physiology is, uh, that where she is, what, what is pretty much happening between her, like in that interaction between her and the environment. And that really changed how we, we can look at science. Like we, you know, I come from a place, we were in a place that if you wanted to know what a cow was doing, you had to get like five interns, put them on pasture 12, 12 hours per day. At night, it was super hard to see if they were alive, if they were standing. I did, like I did a lot of fecal counting, fecal, like fecal events on cows. Like, oh, is the cow actually defecating right now or not? was little with binoculars, with lights, with lantern, things like that that made it like very complex to get data off a very limited number of subjects. And now we live in a completely different world where we can put like 10,000, 15,000 animals or cows in general, that we can have a daily tracking of all these uh, these variables that we want to obviously cost money, cost time, but really, uh, makes us question what we can do and especially how we're going to change the hypothesis, the studies that we are doing when we are faced with that possibility. So we'll talk about some of these possibilities. I'll obviously use us as the example. I will, I will talk about cows. So we have like my, my research lab, uh, beyond other areas is specialized in applied ethology and especially with the use of precision livestock techno uh, precision dairy technologies uh, and we have used probably like around 30 technology at this point in time including the room and bolus cameras uh colors the electronic wearables uh, as a whole and especially some of like i'm very interested on some of the the specific technology and I will try to talk a little bit about that. But first I want to talk about the possibilities, right? Like that idea of the technology is just one more tool. We are able to do things, we are able to collect uh, data with our science still uh, depends on a lot of non-technological, let's say, uh, tools in general. But the technology brings us the possibility to do things that we never were able to do before. And I love this example of Pod 7 in the San Juan Islands in Washington, like here in the United States, that obviously for the last 30, 40 years, we had this identification of who was each individual, what they did. But all of that was done with literally someone waking up, getting a boat, uh, finding where these whales were, or these orcas were, and went there and watched what they could from the surface of the water. And there are many limitations to that, right? You just can see when the water is breaching, you just can see when they are in the surface. Uh, first, uh, you have to find them, the boat scares them, they are wary of your presence, uh, things like that. So here, very simple technology, actually. Some people probably not even consider that a precision livestock, or well, livestock for sure is not, but a precision uh, technology in general. But they invented a magnet. So they were able to put, to with a sucking cup, throw a magnet in one of the whales, and that magnet pretty much had a GPS that control a drone. So for that whole day, if they found a whale, they were able to put the magnet, that drone would follow the pod throughout 12 hours and record everything that the pod was doing uh, throughout that 12 hours without a boat, uh, with constant monitoring, watching them all from above. And so like, just imagine the amount of data that was 
that these very simple technology, a uh, drone that follow whales or orcas, were able to give to, to these researchers. And that's happening to us, right? Like if we think on uh, the animals that are under our, our care or even our research studs, now we are instead of able to be like, oh, what is Cal 12 doing from five to two, five minutes scan? Now we can have 15, 20, maybe a thousand cows that we get second data of these animals throughout time. And that possibility is what I would try to talk about and especially what to do with that data. But like I want to first, like that's my first take home message is that the, the possibilities that are out there uh, are pretty much is incredible, right? Like we are going to change how we collect data of animals and especially their behavior and what they are doing throughout time. So we live in this world with a lot of data and we really need to go through that discussion of how to make that data into insight and especially into action and collectable information. And there are many things for this technology, right? That like first is that the data that we collect, like the census collect actually can be translated to something that makes sense, that is a meaningful action that the information is readily available to the farmer, to the researcher, to whoever uh, is in charge of the technology. All of you need to be robust, like our most of our animals live in environments that require some robustness for these uh, devices to be reliable. All of you has to be cost effective uh, if we want to, to monitor a lot of animals and especially have to be simple and solution focused and I will try to talk a little bit about that. And especially that relationship uh, with animal welfare, right? Like if we think on biological functioning of these animals, this technology are able to go there and measure uh, most of what these animals are doing, if it is what they are eating, if they are lying down, if the body condition score, uh, the weight of these animals give us some possibilities uh, to allow animals and to control them in the environment for some more uh, natural living environment. And especially, we are able to even change some of the affected state based on technology. And I'm just giving these examples because I will talk about each of them uh, specifically. So what are the challenges that we have in general in doing research with this technology, right? Like if you think on a farmer, he's there, like uh, the technology is based to deal with the challenge of these farmers in general. Find these animals to be bred, find these animals that are sick, monitor nutrition, behavior. But for us researchers, and even to the farmer in general, to the people in the industry, the possibility of record data individually for each animal is I think what is the most attractive, what is more, um, what give us the greatest uh, challenge and possibility to the future. So if you have a farm like this, that is very common nowadays in the United States, where you have like a thousand heifers, a thousand cows in the same pen, how, how you go there and pinpoint what 943 is doing or how her life has been? Uh, can we draw questions from what these animals uh, are different? Like how 943 here is no white, as my students used to call her, uh, how what is no white was different than 944, 945? What can we predict behavior? Can we make questions associated to it when we base our hypothesis uh, in applied ethology studies? Can we actually uh, differentiate what these animals are doing individually instead of use group average? And I really think that we can. I will show some data and especially some data that uh is based on that or where we change our idea of research groups of research average to research the individuals to give management to individual and especially collect data at the individual level and use that data to, uh, to make inferences so i will show a lot of data actually from this calf barn a very classic calf barn where the calves had the milk feeder, so they were fed automatically, and it recorded how much, how often, and when each of these calves came to have milk in a program that we set up up front. 
uh, there was a grain feeder that we collected how much grain uh, or solid feed these animals were eating, uh, water, uh, forage, and each animal used a, a collar that gave us the data where when they were lying down, how much activity they were performing throughout that day. So we did, uh, I will jump most of the, the nutrition side, but what we did was to give these calves different amount of milk. So six, eight, 10 or 12 liters per day. We offer them that amount, they obviously drank uh, whatever they wanted, but very close to what was offered. We started to win then at week six, getting 50% of that milk allowance down and then win them completely at week nine. And you can see like I will, uh, obviously it's not rocket science, calves that drink more milk end up growing, growing faster. But is and obviously uh, calves that had more milk ate a little bit less concentrate. But if you see at the end of the time period of the experiment, actually those calves were bigger, were eating more grain, grain intake. However, what about Snow White? Like this is group average, we go there and like this is textbook, right? And that's what we did. We do this. I do this my <laughs> my career halfly depends on this. We go there, we test 12 calves against 12 calves, and we hope that the average are different between them. But what about each calf? What about Snow White? What about the the calf that was there in this experiment going through uh, life independently of what the group was doing? And that is his idea, right? That that calf has to be there. It must transition from milk to solid feed. So a calf that is born, we give them milk for a very short period of time. The point is that it needs to learn where, how, and what to eat. And that calf is there going through that. The red line here is the average. So what I showed, we go there and we publish it in Journal of Dairy Science saying, in average, calves ate. Um, X amount of grain throughout time. However, each of the gray and black lines are individual calves. So we have a calf right there, like the technology come to us and say, during this time, it ate nothing, all the way when we reduce milk, some of the calves all the way to the day that we remove like a bigger chunk of milk, didn't eat any grain any start, any solid feed that was offered to them. Where some of these calves, I like to say, like the little fatties, the, the jowls of the pen, they're like, mm, grain. We are like, this is like best thing ever. And by the time we even reduce milk, some of these calves are eating our target. That was one kilo of, of grain per day. Some of them, by the day that we cut milk, at day 49, are eating three, three and a half kilos. And that crazy individual variance that we that we see in not just in grain intake, in many things uh, with animals, really translates in meaningful action, right? Like if we think here at the winning period, so the time that we are reducing milk and transition these calves into solid feed, there is this crazy direct correlation between final post-weaning weight and grain consumed on that week of, of weaning. And that's almost obvious, right? If you if you eat in solid feed, we are going to cut you out of milk anyway. Uh, you're going to gain a lot more weight if you are ready for that transition, especially if you are eating more grain, more nutri nutrients in general. So that information is there, right? Calves are different, and it's not new. Like we we know that calves are different. Now we are just able to to go there and collect those differences. Uh, easily with a machine from every calf. But what, do, what does that individual variance mean? Where it comes from? What are the source of it? Can we investigate and especially can we deal with it? We'll just make an addend here, like a branch and talk that there is a major thing that is temperament of these calves or personality difference, personality trait difference with a lot of studies and we're still doing actually because I'm very interested on that and especially using precision livestock technology to do that. That is, uh, can we measure personnel? Or can we measure temperament? Or can we measure how these animals interact uh, with the environment and with that predict how much 
uh, grain that we, even if you don't have the grain data or the intake of solid feed data. And we actually found that very, and was kind of expected, the very explorative calves, so calves that are curious that actually interact a lot with the environment are the ones that end up gaining, well, more weight, but eat more grain early on in life. And so what we thought is like, can we actually, instead of manage these animals as a group, can we use that individualized data to individualize management uh, on farm? And that was always the question, right? Can we transform everyone actually in 7032? 7032 actually, her name was fantastic or fantastico because she was born Sunday night and she was a perfect calf, right? She was there. She always drank all the milk that was offered to her. She ate like triple the amount of grain that anyone that we had in this trial. And not important, like by the time that she was done, uh, like her time was done, like her 84 days, she was so heavy that we couldn't weigh her on the scale that we had for the calves. As you can see, like she was above the scale threshold. So can we go there and tailor that strategy individually and especially make that hypothesis, right? Like we are able to have the data from every animal. Can we make management for every animal? And especially to balance some of these very expensive resources that is milk and grain, especially milk that is super expensive for these animals. So our idea was to divide it. Can we make a, an, a, a plan that calves receive a very intense milk diet for the first six weeks of life. And then we tailor those calves to concentrate. So what we did was obviously these calves were uh, able to have milk for the first four weeks of life. And then at four weeks, we reduced the milk in 25%. And now we would self win. So the calf would win itself from milk uh, based on the data that we collect. At this point, I will talk about this one that is the simplest one we've done now with activity, we've done now with other variables, but at that point, we did with starter intake. So if the calf ate the target, so 225 grams, it would reduce 25% more of milk. If it ate 675, it would go 25% less, and then if ate uh, 1.3 kilos, it would be completely wind out of milk. And what we found is obvious, right? The calves that were <clears throat> in the individualized program, instead of the ones that were wind by age, actually ate a lot more of concentrate. But we are pretty much selecting the calves that were eating uh, more grain, right? Because if you eat more grain, you win earlier. However, more interesting than the starter intake that was obviously much higher up to 14 weeks is that they actually gain more weight so different than even without that the calves that were weaned earlier that would be the ones that drank less milk they would end up being the ones that not gain as much weight and was completely the opposite to individualizing those programs so the calves allowed them to express a even stronger feed intake of solid feed than we actually expected. And they were actually bigger throughout time, uh, up to 15 weeks, what is like 11 weeks after the treatment was imposed. So there is this major possibility of actually individualized feeding program. I will, we use feed here as an example, but individualized management program to the calves uh, based on some of this data. So what is the long-term development consequence of these managements? Why are calves more motivated to eat? It's early experience. Uh, what, what make these calves have this crazy individual variability in a starter intake and thus winning age? Some of these calves, actually, the, the earliest they could win is 42 days. And some of these calves, as you can see here, literally three days, boom, three days, boom, three day, boom, when we're wind at 42, 43, 44. And some of these calves were there that even fail to win. They never ate the amount that was expected from them, even 40 days later at day 90. We had to go there and press the computer and say like, okay, now this calf has to win. And that crazy individual variation is seen 
everywhere, right? And if we if we think here on the normal management that we do to these animals, and day 60, everyone will be win. What is actually, you can even see here, that is pretty much the average. So we set up management in many ways in our farms based on the average of the group. However, this two tail of the calves that could have had much earlier weaning having a trouble and the, the opposite as well so will these calves struggle with other things can we help them cope uh can we predict it from a young age which ones are going to be there can we do something about it can we help these calves it's all questions that are still open but what i want to do is to foment this discussion of why we treat these thousands maybe sometimes even hundreds of thousands of animals as this as the same when they are completely different and for us especially on the behavioral side like why are these calves different is that a personality trait uh, influence is it um diet ruminal microbiome is it management early experience there are so many questions uh, to be answered based on that so there are many possibilities to precision nutrition of calves. We are doing a lot of it. I will not uh, discuss much, most of it. But one that I want to discuss is the early experience. Can we incorporate what we know based on some of the management that we do? So I said first, we have this possibility to go there and collect more data than ever before variables that we didn't even think we could men, um, measure continuously now are on like, routinely done so in even commercial setups and now we get all this data we know that animals are different we know that they go through uh experience that are different can we use that data to actually inform what we do to these animals and especially what data we are collecting if we are collecting this data can we fix uh, some of these problems. And Sarah, so sub, uh, subacute acidosis is a classic uh, event in, in dairy cows, in dairy cows in general, is uh, super common. And it happens because highly fermentable carbohydrate in, in great uh, quantities in the room and very classic, like what we call peaks and valleys. So the calf is there, it's a lot of grain because it's hungry, we remove milk, uh, the pH of that rumen goes super low. And then for a while, it, it's much less than expected. Here, another peak, same thing, like one day it's hungry, we remove milk on day 56. It eats almost double than eight normally. And then for two days, pretty much it's like very little and it really affects the continuation of that growth uh, on intake. So can we control it? Can we use that data to actually make intervention that makes sense to these animals? And that was the idea. We can incorporate that nutritional knowledge that we have into feed the programs. And so reticular room and bolus uh, are classic in the industry. Uh, we can use them to measure temperature, activity of the cow, but especially pH on the reticular rumen of that animal we know what we can do to to help with sarah can we use that to actually go there and select these animals that go through uh oh, to go through some of this management and what we did actually was that can we use that data we use that data to select the animals that we thought that we were going to sarah and receive a probiotic that helped with that so those are the possibilities and what, what we can do. So what about um, other things, right? Like I talk a lot about nutrition trials, what I do uh, the most, but can we identify these animals, especially if we have baseline data, saying what an animal does daily or what we expect that animal will do throughout time into uh, an alert system that we can detect these animals when they go out of norm. So if we expect the animal to do AAA every day, one day it does Z, can we detect that like uh, abrupt transition? 
And if we detect that, can we do that? And I will talk about disease because sickness behavior is classic and most people will, will know and understand, but there is many other things that we can use on the same way. So we wanted to see these calves that actually are coming up with pneumonia or with BRD, bovine respiratory diseases, are they changing their behavior prior to that event? So the day that we come in and say uh, 1466 here is clinically diagnosed with pneumonia, can we look back for that days and see like, oh, three days before we actually saw her in the corner uh, coughing, she was already changing her feeding and her activity behavior. And that, the answer to that is yes, we can see like here days of diagnosis zero, so the day that someone come to the farm and say like, oh, this cow actually, or this, this calf actually was diagnosed with pneumonia, we can see data changing for at least five days prior uh, to that. This is lying time, like the time that she spent lying down. But many other things change much prior to disease, like, how the activity of these animals goes through and you can even see like the the i am here so the cow the calf was exactly the same the calves that were healthy and sick was exactly the same seven days prior it opens up day zero these animals are treated and then seven days back uh they actually the groups are non different anymore so it's a, a classic graph we've seen this in in many diseases and BRD is one of the, the ones that we see it very clearly and we have studied you know, quite, uh, quite in depth and line time activity feeding behaviors really changed that five to seven days prior to diagnose of the disease. But what to do with that, right? We go there and we say, yes, uh, 2466 will change their behavior five days prior to disease. We are able, as I said, to collect data from all these animals throughout time. We can now go and say like, okay, these calves might be changing. And what we did, and Melissa here, my former PhD student, now a postdoc working with this actually, uh, the University of Guelph, we went there and like, what are all the data that we can collect from these animals and to create models that we could detect the calves that could be coming or were at risk to become uh, ill. So we went there, every calf used a pedometer that recorded activity, line time, line bout, uh, and time is spent uh, running in the pen. They, we had body temperature based on a microchip, how long they use the brush, what they ate, milk intake, uh, and all this data was collected and using a machine learning model for us to get all these variables together to create an algorithm that say, okay, four is super healthy right there, like chilling, and one calf, uh, this one might be at risk to become uh, ill in the next few days. So we are able to do that, actually, I will, uh, I deleted some of these slides because of the time, but we are able to create this algorithm that say this calf actually is at risk and that risk increases through time. So the calf can be at 50, 70, 80% at risk to be diagnosed with uh, BRD in the next little while. And we use that to be like, okay, if we can identify this calf that might be at risk, what does it matter? So we come around and we, I always joke about that. If I come to you now and say like, oh, you might be getting COVID in the next seven days. What are you going to do? Like, you know, what <laughs> are you going to stay home? Are you going to take medicine? Are you going to isolate yourself? This is a at risk uh, possibility. But one thing that we actually can do is to go there and give a nutritional intervention. So support for the immune system to deal with that uh, early infection or that early disease. And that's what we try to do with these calves more than be able to say, okay, the behavioral change prior to a disease, we are able to tell that these animals are at risk. 
can we actually intervene early enough that some of these calves will not develop that uh, illness or at least will develop their illness with less severe symptoms. So one of the things that is classically used as a support therapy in calves is colostrum, colostrum for some milk of cows, full of all the goodies, as uh, we like to say, like uh, IgGs, a lot of uh, hormones, a lot of uh, highly nutrition, highly digestible uh, nutrients. So we got that every calf that was triggered, well, every calf that triggered the alarm, that the alarm say, this calf might be at risk in the next uh, three days to develop BRD. It received one liter of milk, of milk replacer, if it was a control, or one liter of colostrum replacer for three days with 125 grams every day. So uh, 375 in the three days uh, with colostrum. And what we saw is that what we measure is what was odds of disease and what was the severity of this disease. We actually did it to diarrhea and bovine respiratory disease. We found nothing to diarrhea actually, but to uh, BRD, when we actually just rerun this trial with uh, a very similar model and found very similar things, is that calves that were at risk, so here's a survival curve, Everyone was at risk, but everyone was healthy the day that the algorithm came with the alarm. What was the odds in the next 14 days of it develop uh, a disease? So every calf that developed a disease here would be 1% uh, less, all the way that the calves that receive placebo milk replacer, just 33. So the algorithm will say, 100% of the calves will be at risk, 33 never develop any disease. Where the ones that received colostrum, 60% of them actually did not develop. And we did this without any treatment before we had a 0.3, so a 0.30. Um, so 70% a certainty on the algorithm. So it was very close, right? And it was good because some external validity of this model saying that the placebo thankfully did nothing. So uh, it's very interesting that idea that it's not just you are able to detect these animals now create that possibility. And I just want to use it as an example, not as like, oh, Joao went around saying that we need to do colostrum to calves early on in, in, in the disease uh, detection, but like, having data continuous of these animals possibility to identify changes that are happening on the life of these animals, intervene early and maybe change the outcome of this disease. And we can do much more, right? Can we detect this calf that will become the fantastical calf? Can we detect disease? Can we do more things? Can we apply this to other places in, in calf management? Like, can we use... Oh, can we use play behavior of these calves as a predictor? Can we measure it on farm? Uh, what are the possibilities? And we actually can do that. We can. We are able to be there and say, uh, you know, I always talk about these negative things that we are able to detect and measure, like the calf was going to get sick, the calf is not eating enough, uh, the calf is in pain. But could we use this possibility to actually measure the positive side as well? Like, can we go on farms and say, your calves play enough, your calves are socializing enough, your calves are, are being measured to be in a positive effective state. And I think there are possibilities uh, to do so. So, okay, I would just don't want to talk just about calves. I'll talk a little bit about cows, not, not out of the dairy cattle environment. But what, you know, I want to foment some of these ideas and some of like, how can we use the data, the continuous collected data to make uh, different science and especially different management of animals. So uh, that is this big, uh, was this big headline saying that over 90% of the workers, so the cows in in the US experience heat stress 
on the job. And there are many methods to try to abate the, the amount of heat stress these cows experience on farms. I think most of you have seen, if you know, the farm setup where we shower, the, we soak them, we, um, we mist them with water, ventilation, and all of that. But all of this has been done in a way that was done by the group environment and very little for the individual when the individual variation of how this cow this cows experience uh the heat stress is it's huge so what we did was can we actually actually we were approached by a company a long time ago that discussed like could we have an individual heat abatement system for cows and we did that we created uh, an individual system, so a soaker that is actually commercially available. But what we did is we set up in a way on cycles that we identified the cow that is there, what was the temperature, and especially we wanted to know what was the individual variance that we saw into this animal. So if the cow came through the soaker, it to identify to who it was, what was the temperature of that cow's uh, rumen, and with that would receive a soaker. And we wanted to see, are these cows we train them to use the soaker, so we walk them for, you can hardly see Amelia here, one of our former technicians, walking some cows down the soaker, then the cow would be voluntarily. So the soaker would be there, and she had to decide on her own, like, oh, I will go there, uh, get water on me right now. And we wanted to understand, like, do these cows first understand? And is that individual variance of the use of the soaker? And we never expected to see what the individual variance it was, that it went from, here is THI at the bottom. So THI is the temperature humidity index. So a uh, uh, relationship between temperature and humidity that is how, like, almost like the feels like uh, that we have for humans, where it is increased for cows, we accepted that 72 is where it highly affects these animals, uh, and 80 is actually pretty high for the setup. And you can see that some cows were going to the soaker even when it was still uh, not hot in the environment, but you can see that clear linear relationship where cows end up going more. But if you see each dot is one cow here in the setup, you can see that they repeat themselves here very high, where 60 to 12, the, the green square here is a cow that went more than 200 times in the day uh, in that soaker. And so are these cows different? Can we, we set up things different on farm? And I really, I really think that we can. And I'll finish my last point of the use of precision technology, especially on science and in management of animals, is that now we are able to keep very high reliable records for all the animals on farm. So I always ask, right? Like, well, how many hours does your cows ruminate every day in the last year? And it's impossible to know. Even if you have three cows, you have two dogs at home, like, well, what is the time that your dog spend lying down per, per day? in average in the last month you might have an idea say so like oh it's a very lazy dog that spends 18 19 hours but it's like up from your head right you don't have reliable records to do so and the precision technology give us that possibility to keep those records throughout time and even maybe even do animal welfare monitoring and a lot of that is happening right like a few years ago now uh mcdonald came out and say through that pressure of keeping reliable records that they would partner with precision livestock technologies to be able to monitor on farm every animal every chicken in that case actually every uh every chicken that went through their food system to have behavioral measures of all these animals and able to improve the life of those animals in real time so the possibilities are are huge and they are happening. And that transition from uh, third party audits that we go on farms, we see the cows are doing once per year into that possibility to know what every animal is 
in that variable, like what is the level that animal are in, in that variable throughout time, really change the game. And I would just use BCS, so body condition scoring of cows as an example. So traditionally we go there, literally me here 10 years ago or more, going on farm and say like, oh, this cow is a 3.2, that cow is a 3.5, this cow is a 3.8. In that moment with my eyes, with my training uh, on farm. And now we have that possibility that we can have the body condition score of every cow, every day that it walk out of the milking parlor uh, throughout time. And we did that. We wanted to see what happened to cows. We wanted to stratify uh, the ABS here that is just like automated body condition score from the camera throughout time. And what we did, we went to a big large dairy farm. We follow uh, 2,500 cows throughout the whole lactation. And we wanted to see what affected and especially what was the average. And the first thing that I want to point out is that there is a clear curve throughout the lactation. So let's say that if you go in a herd that everyone is uh, in peak production here on day 70 of lactation, you have a different, very different setup than a herd that will be in late lactation, I say a seasonal herd. But throughout the lactation, 87% of these animals were in the perfect body condition score and we have very little uh, animals, sorry, very little of them actually even ever went down the 3.0 and like pretty much none of them were in the emaciated level uh, below 2.5 from 2,500 cows throughout the whole lactation. More importantly, what are the factors that affect it? Is it uh, calving BCS that clearly if you calve with a higher body condition score, you end up having that higher body condition score throughout your whole lactation. If you get a disease or not, and here has a what is the consequence and what is the cause, right? Like if you get a disease, you lose more weight, or if you were with a lower body condition score, you're more likely to have a disease, but you are able to do that. But just to create that curve on farm, just to create those factors, just to be able to have every animal every day throughout time is a very different setup that we can, we can say for, uh, the keeping of records of that body condition score variable. So what your herd like, what is your uh, body condition score at calving, uh, how many calves you get that are diseased, can we actually make metrics and expect the BCS throughout lactation and, and change the way that you use some of these variables to monitor well for even to monitor uh, herd nutrition. In the last and final thought that I want to give you guys is like, I keep talking about the technology, keep talking about the data, keep talking about how uh, we do things with the data. But the biggest question is like, do this technology work? And I will refer to this like amazing paper, really like uh, this paper discussing, can we use this commercially available technology and validated sensors to welfare uh, assessment of the Ricardo? So if anyone has like the answer to this is yes, some, not all, and we have to have care with that. But um, I think that work on validating it, on like making sure that they work on the environments that we want uh, are fundamental and we do a lot of it. And I think more than the classic behaviors, I think it's our part to be uh, creative enough that we can use some of the technology, some of the possibilities to actually detect other behaviors. Like I wanted like this, I was, this is an example. I think there is this immense possibility that goes beyond the commercial available technologies to merge technology, to do what we want and especially collect what we want. So we wanted to know like, do cabs use the, mach the machine brush if they use for how long? And can we detect the calves that are there and especially the calves that are touching? And this is the problem, right? You put an antenna here to say like, oh, are the animals here or not? This calf would be recorded as it was using the brush, but he's just like lying there on a very nice setup. So what we did is actually was really funny history. I came to some of our engineers and it's like, can I measure if a machine is using power 
is using electricity from the wall. And they all looked at me like I was ignorant. They're like, oh, of course, that is transducers meters. So the transducers meter, really, you put the, the cable that is coming to the machine through that hole, and it tells you when and how much current actually goes through uh, that machine. So we connect that data of, is the calf actually standing? Is the calf actually there through the RFID? And then is the machine or the brush in that case actually bring energy and to make it spin? And what we did is this perfect, right? Like we use a video to see if the calves were there, especially in relation to what the transducer and the RFID system was telling us. So what we did was like, okay, I will pay some in turn to watch these calves and I will get the data from our algorithm that combined the three of them, which like very good accuracy and, pre and precision throughout time of these calves using the, the, the machine. So I just want to leave those three thoughts, especially that individualized programs are possible. We can use this data in science to support management decision, especially to create hypotheses throughout time. And that is crazy amount of opportunities. Like probably in this talk that I was giving you guys for, for an hour, probably something else was created out there. So I'd like to thank you very much. And uh, just as a disclosure of I work for the University of Kentucky. And these are the people that support the research at my research lab and there is my contact as well, and I'll be more than happy to answer any question that you may have. Um, thank you, João, for the very nice presentation. Um, we have an idea of the plenty opportunities and technologies that can be used to monitor the animals and improve the management and the welfare and any other thing that we want to apply. Um, I will transmit you some questions that came from the participants during your talking. I will start with the question of Maria Guilhermina Pedrosa. She said, congratulations on the lecture, Professor João. Um, do you believe that the use of precision technologies can interfere in the human-animal relationship? Uh, so I like to say I, I didn't talk about it today. I like to say that the technology is a tool that will be there to be used for management and to pretty much translate some of these variables uh, to us. The cows are, were always there doing those behaviors, having uh, some of these uh, physiological matters going on and changing through time. But now we are able to detect it and keep that data. Obviously, some of the technology come to replace things that we do uh, manually, let's say, that we go there and do it. And so some of this time, the, the contact time between animals and humans obviously will change. But the way we use technology is up to us, right? Um, however, I think like we have this impression that human animal relationship is normally positive. And many times that is not positive whatsoever. And I use the robot or the, the milk robot as the example, right? We were, if we look back 20 years ago, one of the major discussion was like, oh, how cows will behave towards humans when we don't milk them by hand anymore or what, with machines anymore, like the robot will do and had this perception that the cows on the robot will be a lot more wary, afraid of humans, X, Y, and Z. And that was completely not true, right? Like now we have enough evidence, even just you go to a robot farm and cows are much calmer, they perceive humans much better in robot farms than they ever did in commercial farms. And that's because they, now the humans are perceived as some, you know, an animal that come or a human that comes and look at them, goes around and don't need to push them through to the milking parlor. That is a negative experience in many cases to these animals. So I think the machines is there, the technology are there, but where we, what we envision as human-animal interaction is up to us. 
and it's best to create positive experience to the animals that we are under our care are fundamental and if we use our time and our creativity i think the technology can even enhance that relationship mm -hmm. okay thank you um now a question from maria isabel macedo uh, congratulations on the lecture professor joão does improving the productivity and management of these animals reduce the environmental impact generated by the commercial meat and dairy farming? Well, again, so uh, <laughs> depend how you see that, right? Like, yes, we can use the technology and the data that we collect to increase efficiency. And I think that's that is one of the major objectives that most of us are after. However, again, uh, the technology is just one tool, right? Like she doesn't ensure uh, we can make very like high technological environments that are not um, sustainable whatsoever, but we also can use technology and we are, we are doing so. We are using technology to make them more environmental friendly. I hope and I think that there's great possibilities for us to especially and i will i will make a, a hook back to what i i discussed today i think especially if we'll be able to start to treat animals as an average as a group as like um a lot of you know a lot of similar beings and start to treat them individually and manage them individually because i think that makes a very would make us a lot more close to that efficiency level to explore the potential ability of each of those animals. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, now from Gabriela Ramos, uh, Dr. João, thank you very much for the lecture. Uh, do rural producers react well to the proposal of individualized feeding management of the cows? So, it's really funny because, and <laughs> I will tell a little history on that, because yes, obviously the research is normally years in front of what we can do on farm, but a lot of people do that already. But for me, and they, you know, different than many people think like dairy farmers and beef farmers are like so used to many of this technology, right? Like there are, uh, depends where and depending the person, mm -hmm. always that relationship of early adopter, people that are more inclined to technology, people that are not. But some of these uh, things are well used throughout the world on dairy farms. But one thing that we realize is that many of these farmers, most of these people are read with a time crunch, right? Time is a resource that is scarce for many of these managers. And I really believe and I really think and we use a lot of time in our research to try to make management as automated as possible, right? Why we still think that this, animal, this data has to go through a human to be made a decision into management. Like your Instagram makes decision for you, your everything, right? Everything around us, your computer is uh, full of the your car your car breaks your car for you, right? Like your car brings you back into the lane if it thinks you are departure in the lane. Why we still think that a cow cannot be fed differently uh, if someone don't go there in the computer and say yes. And I think that is the next step is like, can we actually make algorithms and decisions reliable enough that it can be applied automatically without go through that human filter? So can we go there and like, okay, you put a calf into the system and then one day is wind. You don't need, you go there, you set the parameters, what you want, uh, the levels of feeding that you expect, but the machine does it all completely by itself, right? You don't need to be like, hmm, I really think this calf needs a week less. The machine can do that for you. You can do that automatically. And we actually are the point that we could set up that system commercially. And I think that those are the next steps. Mm -hmm. I imagine that in the US, uh, much farmers have access to these technologies and it's a reality that's available for them to use these technologies and these algorithms maybe in a short future. But uh, I'm thinking of in the Brazilian reality when I was 
watching your presentation. And for example, yesterday I was on a farm, on an organic farm, that the milking is manual. They use manual milking and there is no use of any type of um, technology or electronical device for anything. So this is a, a challenging for the developing nations too. So, well, yes, uh, the answer obviously is yes first, but we can see even by the, on the dairy side, the robot milkers are becoming a common place in Brazil as well as they were uh, in other places. Uh, they more and more discuss, we are more and more discussing all the available technology that we have for dairy cattle in Brazil. Like, you know, there is popping up a company every other day. But if you think on swine production and poultry production, Brazil is as technological as anywhere else in the world, right? Like if we go to a swine barn in Brazil, they look exactly the same as would be in other parts of the world, maybe with less walls to control the cold weather. But besides that, like looks exactly the same. And I think that even if there is a delay, that delay nowadays is much shorter than used to be, right? Like we, if we think like when the first cell phone was common in US, and it was common in Brazil, we have that gap of almost a decade. Now, if we think on a Apple 14, uh, iPhone 14 here to the iPhone 14 getting to Brazil and getting a common place, we are talking about two, three years. And I think that the farming community is getting very similar to that place. Obviously, Brazil still has a much greater spread of farms and especially technology on farm that we still have like a lot of farmers that pretty much have no technology whatsoever, but at the same time, we have that part of farmers, right? The 10, 15 percent that is getting very similar to the Western world. Yeah. Yes, the big question here is the inequality. I imagine that the huge difference among the most technological and the most uh, extensive producers. Um, I have one question to you. Yeah. Um, are you studying something related to the hominal microbiota or intestinal microbiota and the behaviors or personality or any other? Reason? So we are doing on the opposite way where we are looking at can we see microbiota change on different personality traits of animals uh, instead of like does microbiota affect the personal trait what is a most common question? Uh, and I don't have any results yet, but we really believe we saw some preliminary data and has some other groups working on it, where it's very clear that some of the extreme personality traits actually have a very different, uh, G well, lower GI tract. So intestine microbiota difference than others. Uh, interesting, thank you. Um, one last question from Maria Guilhermina Pedrosa again. Um, it's possible that some animals do not adapt to the use of this technology depending on their, tem their temperament, such as rumination colors and electronic truths, for example. Yep, so, well, and there is a degree here, right? Like that are very low invasive technology, like a camera or, you know, a, even the color, the pedometers, for more that the cows are like, get a little frail in the first few days, but they, they get used to it, to very invasive ones, right? Not invasive, but like very complex of use ones, like the robot systems or sorting gates or uh, electronic feeders. So some of the animals, and especially that's what I was to work with personality traits started was that they have very different time points to to learn how to use this technology and that variance actually influence. I will not say that uh, uh, that I know at least uh, points where an animal didn't adapt and that affected their uh, possibility to be on farm. What is, is more common is that the technology actually is made to a range of animals and the extreme are not counted, right? And the automated milkers are a class example that if you have cows with 
anatomy or even temperament that that are out of the the expected range the machine do not adapt to that animal and cannot milk it so you end up having to to cool some of of these animals but like i think that is part of the challenge right like everything that is new everything that like will change the way we do things that is this adaptability time and the technology also has it on our farms mm -hmm. okay thank you very much João, for the very nice presentation for answering all our questions um so i, I believe that we finish it. pedro please help me here no, and I would like to thank you, you guys, for the invite and for the space to talk about some of our research. Thank you a lot, John.
Okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am Professor Fabio Presotto from the Universidade Federal de Juiz de Fora. It is a great honor to present Professor Natalia Albuquerque from Psychology Institute at the Universidad de São Paulo, who will give the lecture New Ways of Studying or the Question about Emotions in Animals. Natalia Albuquerque holds a PhD in Animal Behavior in Experimental Psychology program at the Universidad de São Paulo. She is a member of the Animal Behavior Society, of the Brazilian Society of Etology, of the International Primatological Society, and the Brazilian Society of Psychology. Her lines of research are especially the mechanisms of the social emotion regulation in animals in intra and interspecific relations. Natalia, thank you very much and good presentation. Thank you so much, Professor Fabio Tresotto. It is a great pleasure to be here. I, will, I would also like to thank Pedro and Gabriela for being uh, behind the cameras, <laughs> assisting us with, with this presentation. And I would like to thank all the organizing committee for inviting me, for having me here. It's, it's a great honor. So I would like to start my presentation. Uh, Professor Fabio Presotto already introduced me, but I am Natalia de Souza Albuquerque. I have a bachelor's degree in biology and a master's and a PhD in experimental psychology, as he said, uh, with emphasis in animal behavior and animal cognition. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about new ways of studying old questions about emotions in animals. So let's start. <laughs> uh, so to start with, uh, I think it's important to lay down some important aspects of uh, emotions, emotions in animals, uh, in non-human animals, uh, important aspects that will guide our discussion during this talk. So first of all, emotions are directly linked to how individuals perceive the world around them and to how they react to various stimuli. And some researchers will also say that emotions are a means of evaluating experience. Emotions consist of morphological, physiological, and behavioral changes, and several psychological mechanisms are involved in both their generation and their expression. An emotion is particular of an individual, so each individual will feel emotions in a particular way. However, even though uh, emotion, an emotion it is, is uh, a subjective experience, it has observable and identifiable components which can be measured and studied. And this is very important, especially when we're talking about uh, emotions in non-human animals, because we can't just ask them how they're feeling, what they're feeling. We need to infer the, the emotional state. So the study of emotions will be based on the intimate relationship between specific emotions and specific emotional expressions. Also very important to say is that emotions possess both an individual and a social role. So an individual will be able to self-regulate themselves and uh, will be able to react in different, uh, in, in, in different ways when presented with different stimuli, different situations, different objects, different individuals. And individuals, and animals, and plural, they will be able to socially regulate. They will be able to express themselves emotional expressions and read the others through their emotional expressions. And this will allow an exchange of information that will be critical for communication. And also very important is that emotional expressions are multimodal. So that means that we use different sensory modalities to express our emotions. 
and to not only to express but also to perceive emotions so we hear things through audition we see through things through vision and we smell things through olfaction and if we're presented with uh, an object for instance we will have information coming through these different sensory modalities. And this redundant information will, will allow us more robust percepts because we'll have more information regarding the same thing, the same object. And this will help in processes such as discrimination, categorization, recognition. So this is very important. Well, but uh, on the title, I said that we're going to, to look at new ways of studying old questions. And when I say old questions, I'm not saying that this quest these questions are outdated. What I'm trying to say is that for many, 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 many years, these questions have been asked. And some of them are still unanswered. But for some, some of them, we already have. Uh, a great deal of evidence to um, to answer them. But what what are these old questions? What are these questions? So one question, for instance, is: Do animals feel emotions? Um, another question is: Do animals express emotions? And if they do, how do these animals express their emotions? And questions such as, are animals capable of perceiving the emotional expressions of conspecifics? And what about heterospecifics? Is that possible? Well, I present to you a new way of answering these old questions. Dogs. Dogs are new ways of studying these old questions about emotions in animals. But why is that? Why are dogs a new way of studying these old questions? Well, dogs are very good models for the study of, of the evolution of social cognition and social behavior. That is because, first of all, they're social. They are social animals. They organize themselves in cohes, uh, complex social groups. Dogs present very interesting, intraspecific, which means conspecific with conspecific, dog, dog, interactions so we have a whole a whole context of study there dogs uh, present very interesting intraspecific so heterospecific with heterospecific and in the case of dogs especially dog and human uh, interactions so again another whole context of possibilities for studying uh, animal emotions. And dogs live, uh, and here I'm talking about dogs that live in an urban environment. So I'm talking about urban dogs. Uh, unfortunately, for non urban dogs, we still don't have the strategies, we still don't have the tools, the methods to study them uh, in a naturalistic uh, way. Um, but we can do that for urban animals and we can take these urban animals to universities to departments to rooms and all of these spaces are within the urban environment uh, to which the animals the dogs in this case are already habituated they're already habituated to go to going into different rooms different places different um spaces so we're not taking these animals out of their natural environment when we take them to a room for example in an institute of the institute of psychology for instance and these spaces that i'm talking about these universities these departments these rooms they are human made well so we can we can think of a human world but dogs are already habituated to live in, in a human world because they live in a and a, a here i'm talking about pet dogs about i'm talking about family dogs so urban family dogs 
they are used to living in a household. They are used to living in a, with humans, to interacting with humans, to seeing new people, to being new spaces. So again, when we take these animals to run the experiments, and when I say experiments, I have to say this, I'm talking about non-invasive experiments. I'm against invasive experiments and everything that you're gonna hear today uh, from me at least <laughs> uh, is related to non-invasive experiments. So every time I say experiment, experimental setup, experiment apparatus, think of non-invasive experiments, non-invasive studies. So again, when we take these animals to do these experiments in a room, for instance, at the university, we're not taking these animals out of their natural environment. So this confers a great deal of opportunities to, in, to deal with these animals. And we can use a variety of methods. We can use different settings, different apparatuses. We can do so many things uh, without interfering in the dog's welfare and uh, well-being. So one important question is, do dogs express emotions? And I would like to start talking about uh, expressions of emotions in dogs uh, by putting here uh, Darwin's face. <laughs> Sorry, my mouth is really dry. <laughs> I'll keep drinking water throughout the, the talk, uh, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, so Darwin, I'm guessing all of you know Darwin, but I'm also guessing that not all of you know that Darwin was really passionate about dogs. Every time that we think about Darwin, we think about Galapagos, we think about wild species, we think about adventures like far away from humans. But Darwin had dogs, Darwin lived with dogs. And in, in fact, he starts the origin of species, the book, the big book, uh, talking about how much dogs taught him about nature, about evolution, about emotions, about animals in general. He was a big passionate. And these are drawings from Darwin. He, you know that he used to draw uh, things that they that that would happen to him and that they would like to that he would like to um, register uh, to record um, and he did that with the body postures of his dogs so here are some of these drawings the some very classic drawings from Darwin and you can see uh, for instance, a dog that is alert, the dog had seen something and he's curious about that, what happened. We don't know what happened, but we can see that he has an erect posture, a paw up, a very inquisitive um, look. Um, so this dog is alert. We can also see an aggressive dog, a dog with the ears up, the tail up, even the hair is up. Um, and if you can uh, have a close look at your screen, you can also see that he draw, he even draw the movement of the muzzle um, of this dog. So this is an aggressive dog. We don't know if, it, if, if, if this dog is aggressive because it's fearful, because they're um, uh, angry. We don't know that. But what he's showing, the dog's showing, is that uh, the dog is not happy with the situation. So he's very negative. And we can see on the right-hand side of your screen, we can see that um, another completely different posture with the body really curved, the ears back, the tail relaxed. And this is a very submissive posture that we now know more about. But since the 19th century, Darwin was talking about this 
these different postures and these different facial expressions and saying, hey, look, these animals have emotions and these animals express their emotions through various ways. And more recently, in 2013, two researchers explored the, the realm of facial expressions uh, in dogs for the first time in a study that they conducted where they showed, they presented a dog with different stimuli. So the stimuli could be balls, deck boxes, toe trimmers, medicine, someone representing a bad guy, the dog being towed off. So these different stimuli were presented uh, to the dogs and they read, they recorded how the dogs uh, reacted facially. So, and they saw that depending on the type of the stimulus, uh, the dog will, would answer, would, uh, sorry, not answer, would react, would respond um, in a different way. So when the dog saw a ball, he, the dog would show an open mouth, ears up, eyes really focused because it's uh, an, a positive anticipation. The dog wants the ball, so it's a positive anticipation situation. Uh, and this is very different, for, for example, from the situation where the dog is presented to a toe trimmer. The dog doesn't want uh, to, be, to be trimmed. To have his, uh, to have their toe, to have their nails trimmed, um, so he he presents a very distinct manner of response, and this this time he will re respond with very avoidant behavior. So, for instance, the mouth licking behavior, um, licking the, the dog's own mouth, uh, ears back eyes wide open. So these are all um, cues uh, to say that the dog is avoidant, the dog doesn't want that, the dog doesn't like that. And we can see that from our day-to-day -day lives, from dogs that live with us, that are near us, that are close to us. Uh, and I'm sure you would have so many other examples of day-to-day -day experiences where dogs express themselves in different ways through their faces. Here you have some examples. But these observations are less systematic. And today we have more systematic, more objective tools to, to measure the, the facial behavior of dogs. So uh, for that, we have FACS. FACS stands for Facial Action Coding System. Uh, and the first phase of Facial Action Coding System was developed by Ekman and his team for humans. What they did was they mapped the face of humans and they mapped the muscles of these faces. And along with the muscles, the muscle movements that were linked to each facial expression. So if the eyes are doing this and the mouth is doing that, um, what facial action units and facial action units are these units of uh, muscle movement uh, linked to facial expressions? What facial action units are being used to the expression of a specific facial expression? So what muscles are engaged in a specific facial expression? And Ackman showed that humans are very consistent. Our, our, our facial expressions are very stereotypical. We're very consistent. When we express a happy expression, we always use, or at least most of the time, we are using um, the same facial action units and uh, these facial action units, just as an example, uh, they would be A21, AU13, D12. And so these units are used to code, to codify facial expressions, facial action of, of a human's face. 
And what's more interesting is that people have done this for other animals, such as horses, cats, orangutans, chimpanzees, and other species, including dogs. So researchers done, have done the same thing for dogs. So they mapped the facial um, muscles of dog faces. And along with that, they identified the, the, the movements of the, the muscle, the muscle movements that are linked to each facial expression. So we have a map with all these facial action units that are possible um, from a dog face, from a dog's face, sorry. Um, and for, uh, some, some studies have been using dog facts to study facial expressions, emotional expressions in dogs. So for instance, in 2017, Cairo and colleagues, they used this facial action coding system to look at dogs' reactions to different types of situations. So situations of positive anticipation, situations of fear, situations of happiness. And they, they found that uh, for each of these situations, some, some facial action units would, more, would be more likely to appear. But what they found was that dogs don't express themselves through their faces the same way that humans do. Remember I said that humans are very consistent. The, uh, the human facial expressions are very stereotypical. This is not the case for dogs. So when we're looking at dogs, we can see a more uh, variable uh, sort of map of facial action units for each facial expression. For instance, the mouth licking behavior, uh, which is shown here as the AD37 or the AD137, uh, mouth licking can occur in the positive anticipation situation, but it can also appear in a fearful situation, and it can even be exhibited in a happy situation. So this means that dogs show facial expressions, they have facial expressions, they have, we can, we can look at these facial expressions through the facial action coding system. However, they are less consistent than humans. So we must pay attention to that. And more recently, just one second, another sip of water. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> um, in 2022, Bremhorst and, and colleagues, they again uh, used dog facts, but they were more interested in specific situations of positive and negative anticipation. And they had this beautiful apparatus uh, where they would show a dog a toy or food and the dog could see but couldn't reach so there was a time of expe expectation in reaching the the desired object or the desired food um and in the meanwhile the camera would be filming the dog's face while the dog was expecting that uh, reward um and what they found was that uh, following the, the findings of Cairo and, uh, and colleagues uh, 2017, they found that dogs, um, the same facial expression could occur in different contexts and within the same context, um, a facial expression could or could not occur. And the, the facial expressions that would occur could vary. So again, something that shows that for a diagnosis of what a dog is feeling, it is uh, looking at the facial expressions, at least through this facial action units, is less um, accurate. So it's important that we look at all the, all the aspects of the dog's behavior. So if you want, uh, if we want to do a diagnosis, 
of what that dog is feeling. But dogs do have their own facial expressions and they do exhibit uh, some very interesting facial expressions that are um, their own. And this is a very good example this, as you can see on the right hand side of your screen, this is the movement of the inner brown going up. So this is a facial action unit. And this is a facial expression. And with the inner brown going up, it's possible to see this clara, the white part of the eye. Uh, and that gives us the impression that this dog is needy, that this, not, this dog needs something. And we tend to give more attention to this sort of face, uh, dog face, uh, that we, if we want to call it that way, uh, dog face, needy dog face, um, it caught our attention. And what Waller and colleagues found in 2013 was that when dogs are in a shelter, in a shelter environment, dogs that do this facial expression more often were adopted faster than dogs that didn't show this uh, facial expression or that showed it less often. That's huge. Can you imagine a dog being adopted faster because it shows, it exhibits, it exhibits um a facial expression that a specific facial expression that's huge but there was a lot of discussion about the results of this of this not the results but about the conclusions of this paper because the authors would argue that the the dogs had uh that the facial expression for dogs um had uh the function of the had a function like an adaptive function and they and it served um this function as as an adaptive advantage as dogs that showed it showed this facial expression had more success than the dogs that didn't but all the other authors would say no this could be circumstantial this could be due to other aspects that we're not that we're not tackling um, so there was a lot of discussion around these conclusions. But in 2019, Kaminsky and colleagues mapped the, the muscle structure of the face of dogs and wolves. And for this inner brown going up, for this needy dog face, there are two important muscles involved, the R-A-O-L and the L-A-O-M. This one up here and this one on the side. And what Kaminsky and colleagues found was that these muscles are present in dogs, but are not present in wolves. Again, fantastic. So there must have been something during domestication that allowed dogs to have more success if they did, if they used this facial expression. That is only possible due to this, these two muscles. So the, the animals that did this uh, facial expression they had more success, they had more adaptive advantages than dogs that didn't. And these dogs were positive selected, uh, maintaining uh, the, the structure of the face and developing this, the structure of the face in a way that now we have these muscles very well structured in dog faces, but we don't have them in wolf faces. But it's not only about facial expressions. Dogs also communicate their emotions through other aspects, through other ways. Remember that I said that um, the emotion, emotional expressions are multimodal. So here we have a difference on sensory modality that is engaged in communication of emotional information. Um, 
that is vocalizations. If you think of barks, growls, um, whines, and so many other vocalizations of dogs, um, now we know that these vocalizations are context dependent and they are uh, full of information and th that this information is provided through these vocalizations, these vocalizations and will reach the other individuals that will be able to then discriminate, categorize, recognize the emotional expression from another dog. And we even know that humans, and this is very interesting, humans can do that and discriminate facial, uh, sorry, I, 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 I talked so much about facial expressions that I don't know if I will be able to just forget about this, this, uh, these words, um, but so um, now we know that humans are able to discriminate these context-dependent vocalizations because they're so consistent that um, that we can do that uh, just by listening to a dog without seeing them. And. Here we have another means of emotional exchange, emotional information exchange, the tail wag. So first things first, I need to say that it is not true that when the dog is wagging their tail, it means that they're happy. Forget about that. That's not true. Dogs can wag their tails when they're happy, but they can also wag their tails when they're feeling anxious, when they're feeling angry, when they're feeling aggressive, when they're feeling so many other emotions. So we need to have that in mind and please leave here today with this in mind um, and tell people about this so we can prevent accidents between humans and dogs um, because we can't, um, we can't, read the dogs properly the dogs are signaling something for us and we take that for something else and accidents can happen so this is very important um but well but the tail wag has a very important function that is um dogs have this anal gland that secretes odors secretes chemicals that carry information about sex about reproductive status, about um, age, and this information will be transmitted to all the dogs. So if the dog gets really close to another dog, then uh, this dog will be able to, to reach, uh, to be in contact with this information and uh, will just read the information by, by themselves. However, if the dog is apart, this information needs to get to the other dog. So the tail wag has this function of spreading the information through the air. So this information can get to dogs and to people and to other animals that are not as close as, uh, that are not that close of, of the individual. However, uh, there are more to it than we previously known. So in, 20, in 2007, Quaranta and, coll and colleagues, a group from Italy, that is a very special group with very interesting papers. Go have a look uh, at the papers that this paper, that this group publishes. Uh, they found that when dogs were presented to different stimuli, positive, negative, or neutral, the dogs would wag their tails in different ways, depending on the valence of the stimuli, whether if it was positive or it was negative. And dogs will wag their tails more towards the left and more towards the right, depending on the valence of, of the stimuli. And it doesn't stop there. In 2013, Siniscalci um, and colleagues from the same group as in Quaranta 2007, uh, 
they found that this also carries visual information to all the dogs. So dogs that see the right wag, the left wag, or the no wag, they will react in different ways. They will show more or less stress behaviors, and they will show more or less avoidant and approaching behaviors, which is fascinating. So the tail wag has uh, a chemical um, function. It also has uh, a visual function and depends and will occur depending on the type of stimuli the dog is presented with. But that's, that's something. Okay, that is one thing. So we can say now that dogs uh, express themselves through different channels, through different sensory channels, through different sensory modalities. They do that through body postures, facial expressions, vocalizations, tail wag. But do dogs read emotions? Well, why on earth would it be important for an animal to spend energy to be able to read the emotions of others? So first of all, reading emotions of others is very important to several animal species especially to those that are organized in complex social systems this ability allows the acquisition of information regarding sensations motivations and intentions of other individuals and it also allows the prediction of others future behaviors and the regulation of one's own behavior so this ability to read emotional information from others has biological advantages to both the signaler and the receptor of the message. When we're thinking of animals uh, that live in a group, so social animals that live, uh, that live in a cohesive, uh, stable group, it's very uh, important to think of these intraspecific context. So it's important to think of conspecific, conspecific interactions. In the case of the dog, dog-dog interactions. So a dog will express themselves, as we saw, uh, in certain ways. Uh, and as we saw, that it's not the same way as humans. So dogs have their way of expressing themselves through their faces, through their tail wag, through their vocalizations. And they also have their ways of reading uh, emotional expressions. Spoiler alert. <laughs> well, that's the point of the, the talk. So, yeah, <laughs> dogs can read uh, emotional information from other, other dogs. Um, but... So they will use the same mechanisms to express themselves and to read the others. So two different dogs, if it's in an aggressive, uh, if it's in a positive uh, interaction or in a, an, in a negative interaction or in a positive interaction, then uh, these dogs will use the same mechanisms to both uh, express emotions and to read emotions as each other. However, when we think of dogs, it is very important to think of the shared evolutionary history between dogs and humans. So we have at least 30,000 years of domestication, of, uh, of the domestication process, which is unintentional for the most part of it. And uh, it's ruled by natural selection uh, mechanisms and it's very interesting. So if, if all, again, if you want to know more, go and have a look, go read um, texts on the evolution of, of dogs and you will find it tremendously interesting. <laughs> um, but well, uh, let, let, let's go back to, to the topic. Uh, so if we think of, of dogs, of urban dogs, urban family dogs, we need to take into consideration the interactions between dogs and humans. They communicate and they communicate efficiently, but do they use the same mechanisms? Is it possible to use the same mechanisms? A good example is when we show our teeth, usually 
we're showing a smile, usually we're showing a positive emotion. However, when dogs show their teeth, usually they're showing some aggressive expression. Usually it's negative. So a dog needs to know, if it's only just for that example, uh, the dog needs to know that teeth, teeth means happy in humans and teeth means angry in, in dogs. So they have to use the different mechanisms to interact with dogs and with humans. And that's fantastic. That's incredibly fantastic. And again, spoiler alert, um, I'm giving spoilers away. Dogs are really good at uh, reading human expressions. So in 2011, a group, uh, a Japanese group led by Nagazawa um, showed that dogs are able to discriminate unimodal emotional displays. What they did was they, they first train dogs to go uh, touch a positive, a smiley face and get a reward. So the dog saw a happy face, the dog had to go touch the nose on the happy face and then they would get a reward. Positive face, reward, positive face, reward. And by doing that, uh, the, the experimenters created an association that smiley faces means positive means that you'll get something but on the test phase in, in in the test part of the experiment uh the experimenters showed two faces at the same time one smiley face and one blank face one neutral face of the same individual um so the assumption was if the dog that had learned that smiley means reward if the, if the dog could discriminate between a smiley face uh, and a blank face and a neutral face, the dog will co would continue touching the smiley face because the dog wants the reward. But if they couldn't discriminate these two facial expressions, and we have to think this is very subtle information, uh, it's only the, a difference of very subtle information on the faces of a human being, of another species. So this is very, very hard. Um, so, but if they didn't discriminate, uh, they would just randomly choose the pictures. And here we have a video with um, some results. There on the left, uh, we have the smiley face and on the right, the blank face. And when the dog gets the release command, uh, the dog is released for making um, their choice. Then the dog goes and chooses um, the happy one. Now the smiley face is on the right. And the dog goes towards uh, the correct answer. And then in 2015, uh, a group from Vienna, now led by Müller, um, they found that dogs are able to associate different parts of the same facial expressions. So what they did, they used this very sophisticated uh, apparatus uh, with a touch screen and uh, they wanted to see if dogs could associate the bottom half of a uh, happy face facial expression with the upper half of a happy facial expression and the bottom half of an angry facial expression with the upper half of an angry facial expression. And to do that, to investigate that, they first trained dogs. Uh, there were two, two groups of dogs one that were trained uh, that was trained with the bottom half of faces and another that was trained with the upper half of faces uh, so let's take the bottom half uh, of faces as an example uh, 
Uh, so the dogs were trained with positive, happy, and negative, angry uh, facial expressions or parts of facial expressions. And so the these dogs trained here with the bottom half of, of these facial expressions, they, they saw happy, like smiley faces, smiley, the, the, the smiley part of, of the face and the frowny mouth part of the face. And during the test, then they were presented with, no, with the novel face with the same half, so the bottom half, with the training face but with the other half so in this case the upper half with the novel face with the other half or with the training face the left half as a control and here i'm going to show you how well dogs did so this apparatus uh, had uh, an automatic dispenser, a treat dispenser, and every time that the dogs got right, got the answer right, the dispenser would automatically um, liberate a treat and the dogs would continue. And when the dogs don't get it right, then a, a red screen comes up. And you can see the frustration of the dog, like, what? I was, I was doing so well. <laughs> And I must say to you that I would never be able, I'm not the brightest human being on earth, but I would never be able to do such thing so fast as this dog, for example. So they were really good at associating uh, different parts of the same facial expression as one whole facial expression. This is very complex and very interesting. And uh, a bit later, in 2016, our group uh, found that dogs are able not only to discriminate and to categorize facial expressions, but also to recognize emotional expressions, not only through faces, but also through voices or vocalizations. So what we did was we presented dogs with this cross-model experimental setup using both voice and image at the same time, vo voice and face at the same time. So we had two screens and on each screen there was uh, the, the, the picture, the photograph of an individual that could be a dog or it could be a human, it could be female or male. Um, and then on each screen, the same individual would be presenting different opposing facial expressions. So for dogs, playful, aggressive facial expressions, and for humans, a happy and negative and angry facial expressions. And at the same time, we played the sound, a sound that could be either positive, negative, or neutral from the same individual. So uh, if in this case that you're seeing now, if there was the presentation of uh, dog faces, then the, the sound would be a bark. Uh, and if there was a presentation of um, a human, then the, 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 the sound would be the, the person saying something uh, in an angry uh, or in a happy way. And in this sort of paradigm for humans, we expect, and humans are really good at this, uh, we expect that dogs, that humans will look longer towards the angry face upon hearing the negative bark, the angry bark, and they will, uh, they would look longer to the happy dog face when listening to the um, happy bark. So the people will look longer towards the congruent stimuli. So while upon hearing Upon hearing uh, this vocalization, uh, which one of the pictures is congruent to this vocalization, to the emotional information contained in this vocalization? So, and then the human will look longer towards the congruent one. As I said, we used images and sound, male, female, dog, and human. Here's a video showing what happened. 
that was the presentation of the, the images on the screen. The dog was sitting in front of the screen, looking at the, the faces. You can see that the dog looks left, looks right, uh, looks at one screen, looks at another. So the dog is free to move and the dog is free to look to whichever direction the dog wants. So as I said, um, people will look longer towards the congruent one. So we, we measured the, the looking direction of the dog uh, during the presentation of the stimuli. So if it was towards the left screen, the right screen, or towards the center. And what we found was that dogs were really good at recognizing emotional expressions of the different species, dog and human, of the different valences, negative and positive, the different sex and gender, female and male, and when the pictures were presented on the left or on the right, dogs were really good at it, meaning that they do recognize more than discriminating and categorizing. They are able to integrate information from different sensory modalities and then perform the discrimination uh, test so they can actually recognize uh, emotional information from voices and faces. And we also found that dogs respond to emotional expressions. And for uh, looking at that, we use the mouth licking behavior that we already talked about today, this behavior here that you're all familiar with, I'm sure. Um, it's, it's a behavior that is linked to stress but there was no evidence that the behavior was uh, linked to the perception of something negative. So uh, it could be that a stressful animal, a stressed animal, I'm sorry, uh, an animal could be salivating more. And then because it, the dog is salivating more, then is the dog would lick his own mouth. Um, but that, maybe had nothing to do with the perception of something negative. And what we did was we used the same paradigm looking at the looking behavior and also at the mouth licking behavior uh, during the presentation of the stimuli. And it's very important to say that there was no training or no reinforcement. So the dogs were not expecting to receive a treat or to receive any sort of food uh, because they were doing this or that during um, the the test and what we found was there was an image effect surprisingly there was no sound effect and there was a species effect so mouth linking was exhibited more towards negative human facial expressions meaning that this response is emotion species and sensory modality dependent which is very interesting and says a lot about um, emotion perception and the response uh, and emotional responding, if we can say that. And more recently, and now we're moving towards the end of this talk, more recently in 2021, our group found that dogs are able of doing more when it comes to the emotional expressions of humans. They are able to infer the emotional state of a person. So by looking at a person's uh, behavior, uh, dogs can infer what that person is feeling and knowing the consequence that a, a person, the behavior of a person would have. So if a person is behaving in a positive manner, the consequence of their, this behavior would be positive and the consequence of a negative behavior would also be negative. So dogs can do that, which is fantastic and really complex. So for this study, we had uh, two actors, these two beautiful girls here, uh, which is, are not only beautiful girls, but are really bright people and very, 
very good scientists and I have the pleasure to working with them. So they were the two unfamiliar actors. No, none of the dogs knew the, none of these, uh, these actors and they, so they interacted with each other in a silent manner. So there was no sound. So this is unimodal, but there was the, in a very intense exhibition of facial expressions of emotion through facial expressions. They would interact with each other in a silent way. Then they would, uh, during this uh, interaction, they would respond in a positive, negative, or neutral way. For positive, it was happy. Negative was angry. Neutral was neutral uh, way. And then they would sit quietly, neutrally, uh, on two stools, as you can see on the pictures on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, and there was two possibilities. One would be the direct condition where dogs could, uh, they were holding each one ball of food with, with, uh, with treats on it, in it. Um, and these, uh, this situation would allow the dog to go straight to the, to the ball and to get the food by themselves. And another uh, possibility was the indirect condition where the ball with food was on a table in between the two actors. They were not holding it and the dog could see it, but couldn't reach it. So this, in this situation, the dog would need to ask the human for access to the food. So these are very different uh, conditions. And here is the uh, schematic um, experimental setting. So we have the two actors here, the table, a camera here, a camera there, experimenter, uh, who was me uh, standing here. The owner uh, was always with the dog. So the dog would watch these two actors interact with each other in a positive, negative, or neutral way. Then the actors would sit on stools and um, and then wait for the dog to do whatever the dog wanted. And the dog had 30 seconds to move freely around the room and to do whatever the dog wanted um, in relation to any part of the, of the experimental area. And here is what we found. Dogs are very good readers of human emotional expression but they go way beyond associating a smiley face with a reward and a frowny face with being towed off. Well, we, Professors Griseida Rezende, Daniel Mills, Kun Guo, Anna Wilkinson, and I, Natalia Albuquerque, have just discovered that dogs can infer the emotional state of a person and use this information when solving problems. In our study, published in the journal Animal Cognition, Dogs watched two unfamiliar persons interact in a positive, negative, or neutral way. Right after, they were presented with some delicious food that they could either reach by themselves or had to ask the humans for help. We found that dogs preferred to interact with the person that had shown happy expressions and avoided the one who had shown angry expressions. Even more interesting, this happened more when they had to use the persons to get to the food, meaning that they were taking the emotional state into account during decision-making. These are fascinating findings about the remarkable cognitive abilities of dogs, and we hope they will help scientists and non-scientists to better understand dogs. So we know a lot. But, but there's so much more to be investigated. And that is why I invite all of you to get closer to this topic. So if you're interested, get in touch, uh, go um, search for people that do this sort of this sort of studies and just be in touch with this topic, with this theme and yeah there's so much more to know we already know a great deal
but there's so much more to be investigated and to be discovered. And with that, I wanted to thank the organizing committee of this uh, international meeting of behavior, evolution, and uh, ecology. I don't know if I told, if I said it, I don't know if it's evolution and ecology or ecology and evolution. I'm really sorry if I said it wrong. Um, I would also like to thank Professor Fabio Presotto. Um, and I would like to just thank you all for your patience, for your attention. And I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, last but not least, I want to thank the funding agencies that allowed me to conduct to pursue my dreams and conduct these research and uh, to thank the the labs uh, which I'm collaborated with with I, which I collaborated uh, I collaborate to um, LEGES the laboratory of pathology development and uh, social interaction and LECA the laboratory of canine mythology uh, these are my contact information. Feel free to contact me and to follow me and to just reach out for a conversation. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm open for, open for questions. Obrigada. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Natalia, by the very nice presentation. It's uh, fantastic. Uh, some, any questions? Uh, the first is from Vilmara de Oliveira. Uh, really, she has two questions. Emotions and feelings are different things. Can we say that animals have feelings too? And uh, about the face muscles of animals, here you showed us mammals. Who about birds, reptiles, etc.? Et uh, they have facial expression of emotions too. Thank you so much for this amazing lecture, Dr. Natalia. <laughs> Thank you so much for your very interesting questions. They're really, really interesting questions. So the first one, feelings and emotions. Uh, so whether feelings and emotions are different things, are the same things, and what they are, if they're different, um, it's an open topic. Uh, we still don't know how to answer this, and this will vary greatly on the discipline uh, we're talking about. So if it is uh, on a more social area or bi a more biological or psychological area, um, people will say different things. But uh, from my perspective, feelings are um, related to what the animals feel. So they related to sentience. So what they, they feel. And this is the same. So when we talk about sentience, uh, we're saying that animals have sensations such as pleasure and pain, and they possess emotions. So they can feel things. So these are feelings. And then the emotions would be these psychological processes, not psychological processes, but these psychological phenomena that, uh, that are linked, intrinsically linked to, to feelings but uh, involve all the psychological processes that are not um, that are not um, part of of feeling something. Uh, but this is very interesting, and we can talk more about that if you want. I hope I, I, I answered. Uh, just uh, at least I gave uh, a, a, a small glimpse of of this discussion. But, but yeah, so animals would have feelings and emotions, but we still don't know if they're different things, uh, at least from my perspective, if they're different things uh, and what they are specifically. But I, I imagine that uh, feelings are related to sentience and to what a, uh, an individual can actually feel. Uh, and emotions are related to the psychological phenomena that involve uh, other psychological processes as well. 
And it's a very interesting question about uh, whether reptiles and birds and amphibians would have uh, facial expressions. So uh, it, it's, it's not long uh, until people thought that only primates had emotional expressions or had facial expressions because primates have uh, a repertoire or, or facial expressions that are that is bigger, that is more complex than uh, non-primate species. But then we started to see that dogs have facial expressions, that cats, ha cats have facial expressions, that horses have facial expressions. So, well, mammals possibly in general have facial expressions. And I would say that it's not far from discovering that other species or other groups of animals also have facial expressions. Uh, we just need to really try to understand uh, what facial expressions could be or could mean to these other uh, to these other animals. Um, but yeah, uh, as for my question, we still don't know if they have facial expressions. But I think in, it, it's not long until we find that they do have facial expressions. It's my personal opinion. Okay, thank you. Another question from Cassia Malta. Thank you for excellent presentation. What is the most challenging in studying dogs' emotions? There is a method for study urban dogs in the streets to observe it then uh, it is possible to do that also a great question thank you Cassia um, so it is possible I think it is possible to study urban dogs that live on the streets uh, there are some groups there is a very important group in India for instance that work uh, that works with um, street dogs, with mongrels living on the streets of, of India. And they all already found so many things, so many incredible things uh, about, about these animals. So they're developing methodologies, they're developing methods to be able to assess some aspects of these dogs' behavior and these dogs' cognition um, that are animals that are not confined to an experimental uh, room, uh, for example. Um, so we still don't have um, data on emotion processing or emotional expression in non like in ur urban dogs that don't live like in the household that are not taken to to a laboratory or a, a new, in a, an institute, a university. Uh, but I think, again, it's, it's just a matter of time. It's, uh, I hope I will do that one day. And, but we still need to develop the methods to be able to assess that in, in animals that are not confined to an experimental area in the way that we're used to. And the most challenging thing, I think, with dogs, uh, for any animal, emotions, it's, it's a very hard topic because everything can, can change the emotions, the, the emotions that the dog uh, is feeling and then expressing and the way that, it, that an animal will perceive the emotions of others. Everything can change because emotions are fast, emotions are related to absolutely everything, uh, every aspect of our behavior and our cognition. But I think the most challenging with dogs is that us humans, we're dogs pay attention to everything that we do. And they're very sensitive to our behavior. So we need to be extra careful when we're working with dogs so that we don't uh, influence their behavior or their response. Uh, so, for instance, the, the, the direction of our, of our gaze, uh, our gazing direction, our looking direction, uh, the, the ways that we, ch we, we move our hands, the words that we use. For some dogs, some words will have meaning. For another dog, may not have meaning, but then we need to control for that. So, I think the presence, the human presence for dogs is the most challenging 
uh, thing when we when we're working with urban um, family dogs. Thank you. Another question from Pedro Mendes. There is a discussion about the validity and of the analyzing facial spacings for the analysis of emotion in humans, given our ability to manipulate them. Uh, knowing that dogs are able to adapt their, their behaviors through the conditioning, uh, do you believe that this can influence the interpretation of this animal's feelings? Very nice question. Um, again, very complex one. So, uh, we can manipulate our facial expressions. Um, we can lie. <laughs> and we will lie if the opportunity is given um, about our feelings and for many reasons, but we will lie. Um, but we don't know, we still don't know if animals can lie. This is the first thing. We still don't know if animals have this ability to lie. This is one thing. And the other thing, uh, I don't believe that no one, no single person in, in the whole world is capable of conditioning a dog to feel or to express themselves in, in a given way, uh, especially through facial expressions, because it's so complex and it's so subtle and it's not the same thing as it is for humans. And uh, especially when we think um so yeah this is it's a very complex it's a very complex question because if we think that we still as researchers we still don't know uh how dogs express themselves through their faces uh so we're still just starting to understand how they do because it's different uh than human than in humans then i don't think uh one person would be able to condition a dog to express in one way or the other. Um, at maybe one day that would be possible, but I don't think now any, any, uh, any dog in the world, I don't think no dog in the world uh, were, has been conditioned to express themselves through a specific way. Um, I don't think that's possible, at least not now. But, but the first thing is that uh, we still don't know that animals can lie. So we still don't know if an animal is feeling something, if the animal can hide or can manipulate their emotional expressions uh, not to deliver the message that it truly, uh, it truly is. Okay, thank you. A question from Maria Guilhermina Pedrosa. Congratulations on your lecture. Natalia, are there students reporting the expression of emotions in relation to mourning uh, among non-human animals when they lose their tutors? Very, very important question. Uh, actually, there is a very recent paper, uh, Maria Guilhermina, if you want uh, to get in touch, I can send you the, the paper. Um, looking at looking at the um, the expression of mourning behaviors in a more general sense. So this was done through questionnaires and through um, the owner's perspective of of the behavior. So it's not actually facial expressions or vocalizations or body postures, but it's more related to general behavior, such as being more avoidant, eating less, eating more, staying more alert or staying uh, less active, being less active after uh, another dog has passed. Um, this is this, I believe this is the first um, systematic study that assesses that. Um, it, that there's like very interesting results there, and I can send you the paper as I said. But we still don't know if there are 
um, we still can access um, the, the emotional expressions per se. Uh, again, I think this is a matter of time. We're uh, moving in the direction of knowing more of grief in, in non-human non uh, animals. Uh, we have a lot of anecdotal uh, um, observations, but we're beginning to have more systematic studies on this topic. So I think it's, again, a matter of time that we will have the methods, uh, the ways of um, addressing this question, for at least for dogs. I think dogs will be the first animal. Um, to be taken into consideration uh, when it comes to grief. Thank you. Question from Ricardo Castro. Many of us think that people manipulate dogs, but it is possible to think otherwise. Uh, in this case, can, can this have any implications for the way of to understand the evolution of the species? Well, um, also very interesting. I'm, I'm very happy with the questions because they're all very, very interesting. Um, but um, the first thing is that I mentioned briefly, but um, for many people think that the, the domestication process was an intentional process conducted by humans manipulating and changing uh, dogs. But uh, in fact, the domestication process was mainly unintentional and the, it was ruled by natural selection processes instead of artificial selection. Um, so we, ha we only have, and I, would, I would risk to say 2000 years out of 30 of intentional uh, selection of of animals uh, and the arising of of, um, of breeds, for instance. Um, so I think this is this is very important for this question because it, it may change the way that we uh, make our assumptions that uh, we're manipulating and changing dogs to do something, and the dogs don't have their ecological value, and they're only a, a product of, of our intentions, but that is not the case. But the second thing is that uh, some, some, some kinds of training have been trying to manipulate uh, dogs' emotions and to suppress dogs' emotions in order that to them uh, to perform something or to be quieter or to start barking, to stop barking or to doing something else. Um, but these attempts to suppress dogs, uh, to suppress feelings, to suppress emotions uh, of dogs, um, studies have been showing that these, these attempts, they are um, mistaken. Uh, they don't occur the way that the trainer wants it to occur. First of all, it's, it's negative training and we shouldn't do it in, in any way. But uh, if we were to do it, and it's not the case again, but if we were to do it, um, when we try to suppress dogs, uh, an emotion of a dog at a certain point, this will generate uh, uh, a cascade of other emotions. And so if you want to, there's, you have an aggressive dog, um, you have an angry dog, for example, and you try to suppress that, this will uh, this will generate, uh, for instance, fearful emotions, fearful states. So we have been trying to manipulate them uh, recently, but I don't think we can actually do it. We have been trying, but the results are not good. And there are some things that we just can't control. And uh, I think yeah, I think people have been trying, but we just we just can't um, control animals to feel their uh, own emotions. You can try to uh, redirect them, but yeah, it will really lead to something else. Thank you. 
Okay, yeah. question from Barry Gremin again. Uh, can we relate an emotionality and personality temperament in not human animals to animals? That's a fantastic question. So when we're talking about temperament, we're talking about emotions because uh, personality is, is a different thing. But when we're talking about temperament, um we have to consider emotions usually we don't but we have to because uh the the different patterns that we'll find the different ways of responding to stimuli to different stimuli are absolutely related to how animals perceive and react to the, to, to the world and they are actually emotionally driven responses so we have to consider emotions. So emotionality and temperament is, they, they come together. <laughs> they come together and uh, we must start taking into consideration, reading more and knowing more about emotions when we, when we talk about temperament. Um, for personality, it's a bit different. Of course, there is a relationship between emotionality and personality, but uh, there are more aspects that uh, composes uh, that compose um, what personality is uh, social social aspects cultural aspects and and so on um, so it's not as close as to emotionality as temperament is but uh, yeah it's it's absolutely related and we need to start uh, looking more add uh, emotions when we talk about temperament okay thank you no more questions uh, again thank you so much by the lecture um, do you uh, speak in more i'm Anything? i'm I'm okay. Uh, actually, I, I think I, I talked <laughs> uh, uh, too much already, but I'm, I'm just really happy to be here and to have this opportunity. And I want to congratulate all the, all the people that asked questions because they were all very interesting, complex questions. And I think I wish we could have more time than we could extend our, our, uh, my, answer, my answers but i'm really happy with what happened here and yeah and i'm open to to having more conversations about the topic with whoever is interested in continuing um so so yeah once again i would like to um congratulate um the event to congratulate the people who were um watching and participating and I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I could, uh, I could uh, contribute with your event. And thank you, Professor Fabio Presotto and all the organizing committee of this international meeting. Thank you. Thank you again. Um, the activities of the morning are closed. And I will uh, will be back two p.m. Goodbye.